You're watching The View. View. On G View. Gview TV. Entertainment for you. Interviews, previews, and reviews. Welcome back to Gview TV. It's soon time to vote. June 7th. June 7th. And we have another politician passing through our studios tonight. Goes by the name of Tom Rocco Civic. That's right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, from uh, representing from the NDP, yes. um, running and advocating for Black Creek and Humber River. That's right. Good night. It's a pleasure to have you here yes. on GVU TV. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay. Let's talk politics now. So, um, mm. the plans that you have for the community, and 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 at our community, always saying promises, promises, promises. What can our community? Expect from all these promises now. Your your um, health care, you know, any. Yeah. So I hear you. I hear you. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I get at the doors because I'm knocking every day, all day, night, weekends, is this the same thing. Politicians, you, you see them around election time, and and they're gonna promise you this and that and all that sort of stuff, and then they feel very disenfranchised because people all want something different, right? And they feel that their issues are not being heard by the government. And then they look, and we have a government like right now that, that's fall short in so many promises. For instance, one of the things I've been talking about in our local community is auto insurance. So this community, Humber River Black Creek, pays some of the highest rates in the entire country. So you have people living here <clears throat> in the north end of the city that need a car. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're talking about a Bentley or a Mercedes, brand, brand new, top of the line. Just a car to get around. Maybe they're working out in Scarborough or they got family in Mississauga, whatever it is. And then when it comes time to pay their auto insurance, they're dinged. You've got premiums sometimes worth more than the values of cars here. So years back, Andrea Horvath, you know, got Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals to promise a reduction in auto insurance, 15%, for example. Mm -hmm. Never happened. And then after that, they said, that, well, this was a stretch goal, you know. So this is one of the types of discriminations we face in this community, where you have working families, people struggling to make ends meet, people in part-time jobs, if they have work, temp agencies, you name it, middle-class families where they're just getting killed every single time they have to pay for something. It's tough. And the same communities are facing this kind of auto insurance, right? So, yeah. Tom, what, what causes um, something like that, like promises with no action? after elected. What causes something like that? And even one step further, how do you take them to task to implement these things? So as a voter, first as a voter, yes. you change government. You vote. First of all, you, you got to vote. You see, I grew up as a tenant in this area. This is my lifelong home, this community, right? I went to local schools like C.W. Jeffries, Alaya, Derry Down, and I was a tenant for over 30 years of my life. So for instance, the first thing is many of the people that lived in the building that I, that I grew up in, and the families, well, a lot of them weren't voting, right? Because they said, they, what's my vote going to do? No one cares. Right. No one's going to listen. People are at that level of disenfranchisement. So the first thing is that all of us, we have to vote. Right. That's your voice. And the government's watching, right? They mm -hmm. see who votes and who doesn't vote, which ridings, which areas are voting. So that's the first thing. And so you have to hold governments to account. So that's the first thing. Reach out to the local politicians. If you don't like what they're doing, you've got to tell them. You've got to call them up and say, look, you see what you did there or what you didn't do or what you promised? Remember when you were at my door two years ago and I haven't seen you since and you told me this is what you were going to do and you didn't do it? Mm -hmm. Well, what, what happened? Show up at the office, right? So, so just like the car insurance that you're talking about, it was promised and people were looking for that to be implemented and it never happened. So was that an NDP thing? Was that a liberal thing? Who deserves the blame for that? So the liberal, so the NDP pushed the liberal government and said, okay, we're going to support this budget, right? Right. Um, but these are some of the things we need to see. Right. So in that instance, it was us who pushed it. And the liberal said, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to reduce it by 15%. So they made the promise. And we believed them. Mm -hmm. Andrew Horvath, NDP leader, the NDP wanted to believe them. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't deliver. So the people that are at blame here are the ones who made the promise. And the promise was by the, by the liberal party. So on a personal level, I've written uh, articles to a local newspaper called the Downsview Advocate, multiple articles on this. I've talked about it. I've done multiple town hall meetings, and the NDP leader, Andrea Horvath, 
who's no stranger to our community. She's been here many times personally. We don't see that kind of support by these other political leaders. And yet, here she was at Jane and Finch Mall yesterday. You know, last year late we were having food in York Gate Mall on the food court there. She's no stranger to this community and she's shown us a lot of attention. And, and so I'm proud of that. So basically your promise to the people is to, is to get elected and, and, and carry out what you actually promise. Yes. Yes. So, Tom, yes. what are what are some of the platforms that you're running your campaign on right now? Like, what are some of the major points that you yes. think you being in power, you'd be able to change? So, the NDP government is one that believes in investment. We believe in people, and we believe in putting the power in the hands of the people. We're talking about affordable daycare, averaging twelve dollars per family, and in the case of families that are under forty thousand, they would have access to free daycare and nonprofit. Wow. Uh, daycare that's massive that's big that's really big we're talking about dental coverage mm -hmm. all right so that if you it, how many people here don't have jobs that have benefit packages mm -hmm. and so you've got all these people walking around uh, that that might need to go to a dentist they can't even afford it we're talking about bringing dental to people I mean we're the party that created public health care in this country out west and we fought the doctors and the liberals and the conservatives until they came on board with us right mm -hmm. And so we're talking about pharmacare, universally accessible. Again, you have people that don't have benefits and in their jobs or whatever the case is, they happen to have a workplace injury, you name it, they can't even afford the cost of medicine. It's terrible. Are these things being measured though? It, is it <coughs> properly measured to say, when I get elected, yes, we can carry them out and it's not gonna be like a broken promise? I mean, this is part of the NDP platform. It's, it's costed, you know. This is something serious that they're talking about, and it's something that they want to deliver. So I, I believe in my party, and I'm proud of it, because as a tenant for more than 30 years, I know that a lot of the things that <coughs> my party right now is talking about would, would have been a big difference in my life growing up. And I know it'll be a big difference for my neighbors and my community, so I'm really proud. So what is NDP doing different <coughs> to bring out a new set of voters? that they haven't done before? Well, I mean, I've always, we've always had the best ground game, all right? Because we really are the grassroots party, you know? We, we are not the, the party of the establishment. So for us, we're out there, we're knocking on doors, we're talking to people, we go places that um, other people, for instance, like rental buildings, you know, you barely ever see conservatives or liberals in there. And this is the first place I started. And I've been to almost, pretty much every building in this riding I've been to already, and in some cases three times, you know? And How long have you yourself been in politics? So I'm, I'm 41 years old, and I was active since I was 15 years old. In fact, tenant rights is what got me involved. Um, there was a landlord looking to, you know, <clears throat> build on a nice little park area, take away the pool for us, take away the trees, all of that, where we used to picnic and play soccer and, and spend time together. They wanted to build on that. And so I went out there as a 15-year-old with a petition a piece of paper and I talked to fellow tenants you know my dad he wasn't well but he encouraged me if you have a voice that it matters and actually it was the politicians at the time that were able to fight back and 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 actually stop this with the will of the community and it was such an important lesson to me because I saw you can actually make a difference that here this guy a teenager living in a rental building you know whose family didn't have a lot of money or all any of that stuff here it is that, that, that we could actually fight against a multi-millionaire landlord, you know, and, and, and see our, our park protected. It was, it was really something that inspired me and it made me believe that, that there really is power in the hands of people. If, if, and the big if, they vote and they get together and they do what's necessary and they work hand in hand as a community, you can see difference when you do that. So is this your, this is your, is this your first time running? So I ran, this is my third time running provincially. I ran in 2011, I ran in 2014, and this is my third time out. In fact, I had about 40% the last time and lost. Yeah, nice. it was really close. And uh, now I'm on leave from work, but when I was working, I've been working many years with the local city councilor named Anthony Peruzza, in, in, uh, in, which is in the east part of this riding. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm no stranger to politics. And Humber River, Black Creek. Yes. Stands on education. Yes. What's the stance on education for, for <coughs> ND, NDP? Well, we see a lot of schools that are in a state, of disrepair, a state of disrepair. So we need to be investing in those schools so that they're not crumbling. And we see that everywhere in that case. We want to put a moratorium on school closures. We all know the population is growing, and yet here and there you see schools for sale. 
what's going to happen in the future, right? We want to see more educational assistance, more investment, so that you have people that are part of... Um, okay, let me, let, me, let me backtrack on that. Let me say this. We talk about school safety, right? We know that there, that there are youth that are in schools yes, yes. that, um, unlike in other communities, are facing a different reality. It might be a single-parent household. Um, you know, we're not talking about the kind of affluence and the money that you have in other areas. If your kid's struggling, you have a tutor. That's not the reality here, unless they're accessing something in a nonprofit program. So having educational assistance, other people that are in the school to be able to help the teachers and work with students, social workers and whatnot, this can make a big impact, you know? Provide mentorship and when kids need help or they need to talk, that, that they're in a safe environment and that, that can really help them grow educationally. So that's something. We want to limit classroom sizes mm -hmm. because, you know, you have a teacher trying to reach out to all these students. And, and when you have massive, massive amounts of kids, they're not getting all the attention they need. And then it's also difficult for the teacher to be able to teach the curriculum, right? And I think the teachers are so impressed with us that the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario historically have actually endorsed us. Mm -hmm. So that was a big deal. And that's, these are the public elementary you know, teachers across this province. You know, sorry, the city here is saying... Yep that um that these are the people to vote for right this is the party that's going to stand up for education so i'm really proud of that my question now um i know the liberal party came in with um free education for the universities and such how does the ndp plan to continue that or what are their stance with that and the next question would be minimum wage yes what is your stance with that okay so first off you know we would continue but we also want to turn outstanding debts into grants because a lot of the students, many of them, right, mm -hmm. they go into university, they don't have the money to be able to pay for all that, right? And then they walk out with no guarantee for a job, but with almost a mortgage, you know, to pay back. Mm -hmm. And that's really unsettling. In fact, that could discourage some people from accessing education. And, you know, our party and I certainly believe that, that uh, finances should never be a barrier to education. It, it's really terrible, in fact. So you're saying their OSAP loans that they have outstanding be, would be converted to a grant so there's no payback? Yes, so that, yes. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, and then the other thing is that you were asking about minimum wage. I yes. mean, we've been talking about that for a long time, raising minimum wages. Yes, you have. And, and I remember um, a by-election in uh, Parkdale High Park, Sherry DeNovo, where years ago, we were talking about increasing minimum wage. And at that time, both conservatives and liberals were against it. The liberals were against it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they increased their salaries. And so in that by-election, that was like... What year was this? Oh, I don't know. Remember, yeah, this was, was way in the 90s. Was, yeah, I was going to say and, late and, 90s, and, uh, yes, early 2000s. Yes, yes. And, and I remember that um, even the Labor Council was very active. We even had a meeting in, in San Romano and Jane and Finch. Mm -hmm. And I remember some of the labor leaders were talking about raising minimum wage. Because when you put money into the hands of people, Right? That benefits all of us in the economy. I mean, people are, are struggling. I remember what it was like being young myself, struggling to make ends meet. So we would definitely keep that minimum wage and, and continue forward. Yeah. Tom, you just said something which I think is, when it comes to voting or politics or anything, mainly anything in life, money. Money is a big factor for everybody every day of life. So you spoke earlier about um, the car insurance and wanting to have that lowered <coughs> as well. I think another big thing that Canadians or even us in Ontario um, look at is like phones, cell phone bills and like our cable bills. I think we pay some of the highest rates for cell phone um, and stuff like that. And I know there's a lot of promises made to people, but there's also conversations that are had with politicians, with the businesses as well. Because you can't just run in and, okay, Rogers, you're going to drop everybody's bill to $20 a month. And you know what I mean? So how do you balance between trying to appease the people to for lower car insurance, um, free education, lower cell phone bills and, and, and Rogers bills at home, and still work with the businesses as well to try to keep a balance and everybody happy uh, for the yeah. most part. Well, I mean, so, so is this kind of like where's the money come from kind of question? It's basically because it, I, a lot of promises will be made yeah. And then when you go back and you'll say, well, I know my insurance company isn't just going to drop it, my rate, 50%. Yeah, yeah. You get what I'm saying? So there has to be a conversation had with them as well. So what is that conversation? Like, what are you promising them to get them to, to, get them to agree to give us 
cheaper rates or a discount of sorts or well okay so my question to the auto insurance industry which has been asked by many people is that why do we have the least claims right per capita and yet pay 55 percent more than the rest of this country in terms of our premiums right all right and we have no we it's a government regulated fiscal basically it's a government regulated body that's yes. that's overseeing the entire auto insurance industry and yet so they seem to be collecting a lot of money out of premiums we're not putting in the same amount of claims and do we have access to the books where's where's that money going so these are some of the questions and 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 if they're not going to be willing to deliver then we might have to get tough with them right so we'll we'll have to see that moving forward but but it's something that I'm looking forward to because I just can't understand why living here in this Jane and Finch area and the greater Humber River Black Creek community, mm -hmm. why people in Scarborough, why people in Vaughan, you know, why people in Brampton are paying such ridiculously high rates for insurance. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to have a conversation with them and try to understand why it is like this. And I know one of the reasons is part of the risk classification system. And I, when I've written about it in articles, I've talked about it calling it postal code prejudice. Right? Yes. <clears throat> Which is, you know, we have this risk classification system. So um, things like um, your, your previous driving record uh, yeah. or uh, if it, it's yeah. a Honda Civic. There you go, right? Things like that. But one of them is where you live. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that where you live has more accidents, for instance. Yes. And one of the issues is that because I've done a little bit of research, is that it's about benefits. So if you have a job with benefits and you have an accident, they will be the ones first to pay out in terms of personal injury and whatnot. So what does that mean? That means in areas where people... There's less employment? Or they don't have the same level of benefits through their jobs, will hmm. now, right? So, so now, now you're, you're starting to, to the see... social economics of it. So, so this is yet another example of places where people are facing the most injustice and, and are facing the most struggles and challenges. So you're already living with issues and then now you're putting in constrictions mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. Right? So this, these are the kind of things that, that I grew up with. I saw my friends and family. It's I mean, this, I'm a lifelong resident here, you know? Aff affordable housing. That, yeah. Exactly. So what I'm, what I'm thinking here is what affordable housing will automatically be higher premiums just because they're less likely to have mm -hmm. the jobs with benefits. Right. And so, I mean, I mean, look. That's so, a jab. So, so, mm. so, so where's the oversight? Where's the oversight? Why is it that in other places and other provinces they're paying less? And why is it that my community that I've lived my whole life in, that families have to struggle like this? And, and I hear it door, day in and day in at the doors. And NDP is, is, is here to fix that, you're saying? I'm going to fight for my community, all right? Uh, I know what it is to have spent over 30 years of my life as a tenant. My father was sick growing up and he passed away when I was younger, okay? And it was my mother and I that had to, you know, go through life. And, and these are the experiences I saw. And, and my friends and my family here, see, you know, the people that ended up at C.W. Jeffries. And in my community, mm -hmm. you know, we, these are working families, people that um, were not just handed everything, people that had to struggle and work. And I saw that. And I want to be their voice in, in legislature to, to fight for us. Touching back on like complaints that the community would make, saying after a party has been elected, we don't hear, we don't see them again after election day, after June 7, just to say, how can the community reach out to you guys? We need, we need something. Um, you promised this, but it's been a year now, and nothing ain't happening. We're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And even to add to that, where is the accountability? So if Sean Bush writes you a letter, what is your accountability to respond to him? Well, I mean, you see, this is where voting comes in, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a politician gets elected, they hold an office. They typically will have a constituency office, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's up to them to respond to the needs of the community when they call them, to call them back. Simple things like that. Um, is there an onus, really? Like, are, are they forced to do that? I mean, it's their choice. But then it's, in turn, the choice of the voters, you know, in four years, to say, did I like the job that he or she did? Am I satisfied with it? 
you know? Maybe they said no to me when I asked them for something, but they explained to me why maybe it couldn't happen. But did they even answer? Did they take the time? Did they give me time, you know? These are the things, but this is always up in the end to the voter, and that's kind of why I started by talking about that, that, that it's also up to us as communities to vote. One of the things that I've been dealing with Elections Ontario, you know, um, we, have, we have one of the largest densities of rental buildings, okay, in, in the entire province in this constituency. And yet, so many, so if you look at the municipal elections, a lot of these buildings that have hundreds of units have a, a polling station downstairs. Right. At the provincial level, we're not seeing that. People have to walk. So, so you've got people that are disenfranchised, in some cases maybe working multiple minimum wage jobs and everything else. And we're almost making it harder for them to vote relative to them voting municipally, even relative to other ridings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've always pushed, especially tenants too, you, you have to have a voice, you have to go out there. Another thing our community talking about is safety, policing, and, and, and the, the, the shortage of, of policing now. Is, is that something that looks like it's going to be in fix? fix soon or, or you know when I talk about safety right um, my idea of it, it it's not just about police it's it's about do we have programs for youth and for people to to get proper mentorship places to go you know um, this is one of the things that I always focus on when I'm talking about uh, in investment right we've got amazing nonprofit associations and whatnot that are operating here for young people to encourage them if, if they're facing challenges or pressures to be in gangs. Do they have safe places that they can go and, and have strong mentorship or role models that can talk to them, see what they're dealing with and make them feel safe? So when I talk about safety, I like to spend a lot of time as well talking about that. That's something that's really, really important to me. And working with City Councilor Anthony Perusa, we have a lot of wonderful organizations operating in our area that uh, we're in touch with all the time. So. I think that's a really important thing that people need to focus when they talk about safety, to ask like what are the root causes, why, why are we in this situation in the first place and how do we have a long term strategy to address this. And some of those things are the things I talked about. So bringing up that bar, you're raising minimum wage, you're giving more families financial independence so that they're not feeling in a state of desperation and then that passes on generationally. So people need to have opportunities, right? And these are some of the things too. So when I talk about safety, I like to focus on those things. Okay. So for somebody who's never voted before, <coughs> what do they need to know and how to vote and what should, do they need to bring? Okay. So if you haven't voted before, um, you have to be a citizen to vote. Okay. Um, if you're already on the voters list, you'll probably get a card. Yes. Right? Um, if not, you should contact Elections Ontario or contact the local, your nearest local campaign. If you want to call my guys, if you want to call me, my office, it's 416-635-8995. And we could put you in touch with, um, with Elections Ontario to get you on the voters list. Um, you, but it's your right to vote. So if you can show a proof of address and bring that stuff when it's time to vote, that you're a citizen and that you have proof of address to the polling station, it should be your right to be able to vote. So I see, they, for people who don't know, there's polling places all over the place. Can you walk into any poll or does it have to be a specific one? Yeah. Yes. That yes. gets yes. a lot of people a lot of times. Yes. I know. I know of people that have gone for their first time to vote. And, and they just walk in and say, hi, I'm here to vote. And then they'll say, no, no, you got to go to that polling station. And they go to that No, no, it's this one. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. If you call, if, if you're not on the voters list and you want to get on, uh, you can call my office, 416-635-8995. Give that a number again. It's 416-635-8995. And um, we'll put you in touch with Elections Ontario and to get you signed up. And make sure you ask, where's my polling station? Where do I vote based on where I live? And okay. uh, they'll, they'll uh, get you ready for that. So Very important. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we were talking to Tom Rakasavik from the NDP. He's advocating for the, the Black Creek and the Humber River area. June the 7th is the election. So do remember to come out and vote. You're, 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 I've got a motto, and I say it every year because politics and politicians, it's very near and dear to my heart. I say, bad politicians are elected by good people who don't vote. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> so you can't complain if you don't vote. Okay. Your first vote or your first complaint is with your vote. 
So it gives you a right to have a talk. So it's important to have a have a right to have a talk. And Fine China, you said you're you're born NDP. I wouldn't say born, <laughs> but I from I had a choice uh -huh. in '98 when I did my first voting. Mm -hmm. I've been NDP and I haven't switched. And and they've been doing everything they said they're gonna do. I wouldn't say they've done everything, but they're closest for me. I also say this: you're never gonna find a party that meets your match 100. Okay. percent If you can find even 70 percent mm -hmm. and agree with 70 percent, the rest will fall into place right okay yeah she's yes she hit it on there yes, <laughs> okay. and, and I'm not advocating for them but yeah. if if the NDP falls in line with some of your values your morals and your wants by all means explore them if the liberals are who you've been with traditionally and that's that's the problem like we were saying last week is mm -hmm. that a lot of people because their family has been one way they're afraid to listen to what to the, the next party yeah. has to say. And there's nothing wrong with listening. It's about having a conversation and finding out what works for you. So I'm calling on the community to go out and vote June the 7th, election day. And uh, you could actually vote before that as well too. Yeah, there's advance, yeah, there's an advance vote that's coming up. I don't know exactly the exact date, date. that it's starting as mm -hmm. of yet, but I believe you can start voting at the, the elections return office. So yes, if, um, again, if, if you don't have time on that yeah day. and and make I, and i'm telling people to make plans for that too because i was think gonna ahead, say right? one more thing isn't yeah. it doesn't the law give you a certain amount of hours off of work to vote i believe so but uh, a lot of people don't know that right mm -hmm. you're, you're entitled to three hours yes. from the job to go out and vote okay it's your right it's your voice let me see how that work with the boss they, no you, <laughs> if you go to the boss they have they have to they cannot legally deny you your time okay. to vote okay well, when I'm MPP in my in my home riding, all right. And if, if any of if any of the community goes out there and they want to vote and their boss is getting them trouble, you call my office, there all right, after go. this election. <laughs> Number again, Tom. Four one six six three five eight nine nine five. There you go. Thank you, Tom. It was it was a pleasure having you on GVU it's, TV. It's my pleasure. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank knowledge. you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Viewers on the outside, vote. Keep it locked. Vote. Do remember to vote. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back on GVU TV, we'll talk more.